When we talk about forefathers, we must never, never forget individuals such as Pixley Kaisa Kaseme. We must never forget people like James M. and Kwejiragri. We must not forget people like Chek Ante Diop. And if we want to go into the diaspora, we must never forget individuals such as Marcus Garvey of Jamaica. And we must never forget individuals such as W.E.B. Dubois. And In this video, we take a look at this speech which was delivered by Professor P.L.O. Lumumba, who is a Pan-Africanist. And this professor has given a lot of speech that is very brilliant. And in this speech, he acknowledges the work of some founding fathers who were very visionary about Africa. And paramount among them that he mentioned is Marcos Gavi from the country of Jamaica, who had a vision for Africa to unite, who had a vision for Africa to be put together and ruled by a single individual so that black people could regain their place in the human race. The work of Marcos Garvey is not undeniable by any African on the soil of Africa. This professor acknowledges Marcos Garvey and other leaders who were very pivotal against the fight for independence and the crafting of a vision for Africa to be united. So in this video, we'll take a look at exactly what he said in his speech and we'll come back here and discuss more about it. But before that, if you haven't yet liked this video, kindly like the video and also subscribe to the channel. Let's watch the videos together. And my paper is entitled the vision of the founding fathers looking to the past to inform the future. And I will be alive to the fact that the element of religion is at the heart of the theme that is being interrogated this afternoon. When I was thinking about the paper, the first question that I asked who are the founding fathers or who are the founding fathers that the framers and organizers of this conference had in mind? And I was convinced that they must have had in mind some of the key figures that were present in the 1940s and 1950s and 1990s up to 1980s and indeed up to the 1990s who participated in the liberation of Africa. But yet even as I thought so, I was conscious of the fact that when one examines history, particularly the history of the black people, there are a number of individuals who are founding fathers but are rarely mentioned when we talk about Africa. One of the individuals who came to my mind is a great South African about whom we say very little, Pixley Kaisaka Seme. The South Africans in this assembly will be aware of that great South African who was one of the founders of the African National Congress. And if they care to examine some of his early works, they will also be familiar with one of the greatest speeches ever delivered by an African, delivered at the University of Columbia in the month of April 1906, titled The Regeneration of Africa. Those, of, those who have had the privilege and honor of examining that piece of writing acknowledge that Pixley Kaisa Kaseme was very conscious of the status of Africa as it was in those days. You will remember that by 1906, Africa had suffered the fate of partition in Berlin and that it had been partitioned as we know amongst the European powers, prominently the Germans had their share in West Africa, they had their presence here in Rwanda and Urundi, 
they were present in what was then Tanganyika, the French were present, the Portuguese were present, the English were present, the Belgians were present, the Spaniards were present, the Arabs were present, although they were not part of the club that petitioned Africa in 1884. And therefore, when he was talking about the whole idea of the regeneration of Africa, the choice of his words, because he was speaking in a foreign tongue, which I am speaking in this afternoon. He was very clear about the words that he chose. He talked about the regeneration of Africa. And when one talks about regeneration, it means that there was an Africa which had a certain level of development and that that had suffered at the hand of the foreigners and therefore it needed to be regenerated. Those of you who are familiar with the thoughts and works of Senegal's Ante Cheikh Diop will know that Ante Cheikh Diop does recognize that there was indeed an Africa which had certain levels of civilization. In fact, the more romantic historians suggest that when Europe and Europeans were still living in the caves, in the western part of Africa, there were organized kingdoms and that there were libraries which rival the largest libraries in Africa today. Indeed, those of you who are students of religion like Professor here will know that people like Augustine of Hippo or Athanasius, some of the early thinkers in religion were resident in what may today be called the Maghreb. In other words, therefore, when Pixley Kaisa Kaseme was speaking in 1906 and he was talking about the regeneration of Africa, he was telling us that Africa needs to rediscover herself and that Africa needs to move a notch higher in order to find her pride of place amongst the committee of nations. It is instructive, therefore, that the works and the ideas of Pixley Kaisa Kaseme were to be picked and developed a little later in time by other great African thinkers, yet one who is seldom mentioned, James Emmons Kwejiragri of Ghana, normally referred to as Agri of Africa. Many of you, particularly the Ghanaians who are here, will remember that James Emmons Kwejiragri was the first Ghanaian to earn a PhD and one of the early African leaders of the famous Achimota College in Accra, Ghana. And James Emmons Kwejiragri was indeed very clear in his mind. The story is told of James Eman Kwejiragri, which I'll relate to you now that I have more time than I was allotted to me. And the story <laughs> is one that has been told by different people in different ways, but even if I retell it in the manner which offends the original story, my point will still be made. The point is this. He said, and he remembers as a teacher that at one time, there was a poultry farmer. And he says that this poultry farmer could only keep one thing, because when you're a poultry farmer, you only keep chicken. But he remembers that at one time, some of his chicken that he was keeping strayed into the bush. And when they came back home, there was within their ranks another chick which did not look like them. It was the chick of an eagle. And one day after a passage of time, a naturalist came to the farmer and saw the eagle in, its all, in all its splendor. And he said, this is not chicken, this is an eagle. But the farmer said, I know. It was once an eagle, but it has been fed on chicken feed for too long. It has long lost its chicken hood. It has now, it has long lost its eagle hood. It has now acquired chicken hood. And the poultry farmer, the, and the naturalist said, no, once an eagle, always an eagle, no matter how long you are fed on chicken feed. And the naturalist said, the farmer, the farmer said, I want you to demonstrate. And in the evening, he put 
the chick on his palm and urged it to fly, but it refused to fly. And the story is told, the farmer said, I told you. It was once an eagle, it was fed on chicken feed, it has lost its eaglehood, it is now a chicken. But then the following day, the naturalist came early in the morning and as the sun was rising, he put the chick on the palm of his hands and urged it on and it flew and flew and never came back again. And he said, I told you, once an eagle, even if you feed it on chicken feed, it will remain an ego. And he said so animated, it is reported. That is who an African is. He could have been fed on chicken feed, but it has never lost its egohood. <laughs> James M. and Kweji Ragri was underlining the fact that no matter how devastated you are, you will always have that inner self. And I think the person who captured it in order to lay the basis of this as an artist is a man that we, called Wales, we call Wale Soinka. Now many of you who are Nigerians here will remember Wale Soinka's famous writing, the man died, the man died, the man died, the man in you must never die, and the man includes the woman. And I'm laying this basis for us to understand that when we talk about forefathers, we must never, never forget individuals such as Pixley Kaisa Kaseme. We must never forget people like James M. and Kwejiragri. We must not forget people like Czech Ante Diop. And if we want to go into the diaspora, we must never forget individuals such as Marcus Garvey of Jamaica. And we must never forget individuals such as W.B. Dubois. And one of the things that they underscored in those early days before I come to the forefathers that we are much more familiar with is that Pixley Kaisa Kaseme in his writing and his speech, which I've already talked about, he said, in order for Africa to realize our potential amongst the committee of nations, there is only one thing that must define African relationship with other civilization. He called it multidimensional osmosis. And what he called multidimensional osmosis becomes much more relevant, particularly today, when we are trading with China, when the osmosis is not multidimensional. And the osmotic is only in one direction, is monodirectional. And what he meant at that time is that Africans must engage with other civilization, but that that engagement must be of such a nature that it is mutually beneficial and the relationship is symbiotic. And I think that that is what we want to underscore today, even as we talk about religion and the place of religion in giving pride of place to self-governance and religious freedom as an important pillar in one of the seven pillars of Africa Agenda 2063. But yet I cannot at this stage yet go into Africa Agenda 2063 before I examine what was the vision of our founding fathers and who were they. In my own examination, and I stand to be corrected on this, whenever we talk about the founding fathers of Africa, we are normally directed to remember the 32 leaders who gathered in the month of May 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And I encourage us to look at the views of these individuals, but even before we go to that particular period, to look at some of the early thoughts and some of the things that animated these individuals to the extent that we now call them the founding fathers and what it is that they had in mind that defined them as the founding fathers. And I take us back to 1957 in Accra, Ghana, on the day that the country then known as Gold Coast regained her political independence. And see how deliberate I am. I'm saying the country regained her political independence, did not acquire her independence. She regained an independence that she had lost by dint of force and by dint of both strategy and stratagem. In 1957, on the day of the regaining of the independence by Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah was as passionate as he was eloquent. He said that the independence of Ghana meant nothing 
unless all the other African countries were independent. And what did independence mean? Because at that time, and you will give me a little latitude in order to give some flavor to my presentation. If you look at the individuals who are present at that time in terms of the commonality and the unanimity of their vision, one had to look at Africa and understand what it is that they were talking about. In West Africa, if you listened at that time to Kwame Nukuruma, his clarity of vision is that independence and liberty meant a number of things. One, the liberty of the individual as individual to exercise their thoughts and to be free to participate in the affairs, including religion as I understand it, and that therefore Kwame was conscious that the country that he had participated in liberating, which was Christian Gold Coast, Gold Coast but he rechristened and the people rechristened Ghana, was a multi-ethnic country and a multi-religious country and a country that was rich in her diversity. And the same was true of every other country. So that if you listened at that time in next door to Ni in, in, uh, in Nigeria, which was, as you know, until independence divided into three regions, the northern region, the eastern region, and the, 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 and the western region, you could see that even at that time in Nigeria, while the colonialist was conscious of the religious differences, the leaders of the day, even if grudgingly so, were conscious of the fact that now that they had found themselves in this geographical space, they had to tolerate each other. So that when you are listening to the Muslims in the north, when you are listening to Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa in Nigeria or the Saudana of Sokoto, Sah Ahmad Dubelo, and listening to Namdi Azikiwe, who is a Christian, they are conscious of their diversity. They are grudgingly in Nigeria, but they accept the fact that they must live together. Religion and religious differences was not given the pronouncement and the accent that we now see in the manner that I shall demonstrate when I am concluding my presentation. So that even if you left countries that had that kind of diversity and you went to Algeria and you listened to the more casual thoughts of Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella, you could see that he was conscious of the fact that even though we were finding ourselves in potential religious conflict, we had a common vision for Africa. And in that regard, you would listen in Liberia, or rather in Algeria, to Ahmed Ben Bella. You would go down to Guinea to Ahmed Seko Touré. You would go to Egypt to Gamal Abdel Nasser, leading an Egypt that was fundamentally Muslim, but conscious of the fact that there was an Africanness. But there were also other individuals who at that time did not believe that God existed. They were persuaded that there was something called materialism, that they were persuaded by a different ideology. But even in that appreciation, they were conscious of one fact, that there was a continent called Africa and that that Africa was a continent that needed to move in one direction. And you will discover such individuals when you come to Kenya, when you come to Tanzania, we talk about people like people who are Christians, committed Christians, such as Julius Kambarage Nyerere, and you went down to the people who did not quite believe in Southern Africa, like Agostino Nato or Samora Moises Marshall at that time. But what is critical for our presentation is that in May, 1963, 32 leaders congregate in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, at the invitation of Emperor Hail Silas. And I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to take time this evening or hereafter to read the speeches that were delivered by each one of them, and I've read each one of them several times. Even the ones who later disappointed us, the spirit was on them. 
the spirit was on them. And I will only isolate a few of them in order for us to appreciate how far they could see. As I stand here, I remember the speech of David Dako of Central African Republic. He says that Africa must unite and move in one direction for how would a little country such as Central African Republic survive in the face of the sustained machinations of the erstwhile colonial power. We know that David Dako did not live up to the dreams that we thought he would. I listened to speeches such as those of Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania. He said, we did not come here to talk about unity or to remind ourselves how unity is important. We have come here to affirm the fact that without unity, Africa is never going to realize our potential. And one can go on to the speeches of Modibo and others and Hail Silasi and others, but it's not important to rehash those speeches because they can be located in libraries. But it's important to isolate one speech, the speech of Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma, because that, for those of you who are French speakers, that was the pièce de résistance. It was the speech that, in my view, captured the essence of what was meant to be Africa. And the three things that stand out in the speech and therefore form the three-legged stool upon which my presentation will now be founded. He said that Africa must unite and unite immediately before the leaders who are present in that forum became, become used to the trappings of power. You and me know that they have now become victims of the trappings. He said that we must unite and come out of that arrangement with one army, with one currency, with one united country because the former colonial powers had yet devised another method of controlling Africa. And he said that that thing which we later re re examined and recognized as neocolonialism was alive and well. And he said, if we did not do so, Africa will never realize our potential. That is the Africa about which you want me to remains in order for me to determine what was the vision of the founding fathers. Their vision was a united Africa. Their vision was an Africa that was united in our diversity. Their vision was an Africa that would tell her story. Their vision was an Africa that would exploit our resources for our benefit. Their vision was an Africa that would sit at the dinner table of human civilization, not as food to be consumed or as a waiter, but as a diner to enjoy the goodies of life. That was their vision. But the question is, that vision, that vision that saw Africa liberate herself from the clutches of colonialism, was it merely flag independence as Kenya's Ngugi Wathiongo says, not in so many words in his book, Decolonizing the Mind? Was it a total liberation of the peoples of Africa? In his famous television program, Kenya's Ali Mazurui, the program titled Africa, a Triple Heritage, Ali Mazurui says passionately and eloquently as one, at once that Africa is the only continent on earth that consumes that which she does not produce and produces that which she does not consume. <laughs> and he says, curiously, we are the only continent on earth that is still referred to in the following derogatory terms, Anglophone Africa. Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa, and those who are generous even refer to some part of Africa as a, a Arabophone Africa. He says they do not say that of Latin America, they do not say that of Asia. And if you doubt Ali Mazurui, there is now a war that is going on 
in the Cameroons and is characterized as a war between the Francophones and the Anglophones. But if you go to the so-called Anglophone area, no more than 5% can speak eloquent French. Yet there are many ethnicities in that part of the world. And I'm submitting to us that this is important because it demonstrates that there is something in our minds that we have yet to liberate ourselves, we have yet to decolonize our mind, which Ngugi Wathiongo says is a prerequisite to our total liberation so that we can engage with the world meaningfully. Welcome back. So in this speech, this professor by the name Professor P.L.O. Lumumba, who is from Kenya, he is a lawyer as well as a Pan-Africanist. He has been given several speech around the world and his speech are very brilliant and excellent. He always share his ideologies about Africa and how Africa can gain its place in this world. In today's video, he mentioned about leaders, the vision of leaders in Africa, and also spoke about Marcos Gavi, who was from Jamaica, and his vision for Africa to be united. He mentioned some founding fathers of Africa, including Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and other leaders who fought for Africa's liberation from colonial rule. And he has this message to be passed on to leaders in Africa as well as leaders in the diaspora, most especially leaders in the Caribbean because definitely they are connected with the continent of Africa. So leaders in Jamaica, the Prime Minister Andrew Holness, as well as other leaders across the Caribbean island. He stated in his video that leaders need to work together in other for a common goal to be established. In this world that we find ourselves, leaders need to work together with other leaders from other parts of the world on a level playing field so that Africa can develop, Africa can also gain its place in this world. Let me know what you also think about all this in the speech that he gave in the comment section below. Don't forget to share this video to your friends. Kindly like the video as well. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel too. Just look at the subscribe button down here. Click on the subscribe button. Click as well on the notification bell. And I'd like to see you again in my next video.